Well, good morning and welcome to Fresh Start. And let's all stand and praise God together. church. It's good to see each of you here this morning. Um, I want to just extend a warm welcome to everyone that's here. Um, and for those of you who know us, um, this today, this month marks our 13th, beginning of our 14th year here at First Baptist. Uh, we came 13 years ago and joined this family who accepted us as we are, loved us where we were, encouraged us to grow on our journey, and that's what I'm, we've been doing now for over 13 years, ever since I've been here. And I wanted to say to the folks online, uh, thank you for joining us today. In fact, a little interesting note here, um, our online attendance has more than doubled 
in the last few months. I mean, it's amazing how many folks are watching from across the country and different, and different countries as well. Uh, and so to you, we'd like to say a special thank you. And there's a QR code on the screen up here. If you want to take a little, um, I don't know how that works, but you take your phone and do something with it um, and let us know something about you. Uh, it's proof that our church loves old people because that's beyond my pay grade. Um, so anyway, if you'll do that. And for those of you who are here in the, uh, in the room this morning, um, if you'd like to fill out a connection card for us and tell us a little bit about yourself and how we can connect with you later on, we would appreciate that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we continue to worship. Loving Lord, you have loved us where we are, loved us as we are, and loved us on the journey to become more like you. You have loved us in so many ways through this congregation, through the amazing preaching, the diversity of preaching we experience here every week, week in Fresh Start, the amazing teaching that we get in our small groups, the fellowship that has become, for many of us, has become our family. We thank you for this time. We thank you for the music that lifts our hearts toward you and encourages us to love one another and to be your voice in the world today. May our smiles, may our hugs, may our voices, may all that we do bring honor and glory to you and encourage one another. And we ask this in the beautiful and strong name of Jesus. Amen. Would you continue to sing with us and stand, please? Let the light of heaven shine as we 
Good morning. morning. Y'all, school is back. Yeah. I, I think school should have started earlier. I, I think, I think mid-June. Right now that I'm graduated. So no matter when school starts, it can be full of anxiety and stress for those who are getting ready to embark on an entirely new school year, new classmates. Some people new schools, some people new jobs, and so what we want to do this morning is we want to take uh, our pastoral prayer and we want to make it a communal prayer. And so what we're going to do is in a few minutes, uh, Shelly and Miss Charmaine are going to lead us in a blessing of the backpacks litany that we're all going to participate in so we can pray over everyone involved who is, who is getting ready to start a new school year. Um, before that happens... Um, I want the students to stand up first. Any student, any age, so you can be graduate school, elementary school, preschool. If you are a student, we would love for you to come forward uh, to Shelly. Shelly has uh, backpack tags for you. Um, And I have uh, little stickers that I made for the youth. I got on Canva, and I didn't know I could do that, but I made stickers. Uh, and so we want to we wanna bless you and give you something tangible to hold that says this is from us, a reminder that uh, at the depths of, of, your, of your anxiety in the school year, which that is coming, uh, we're still with you and God is still with you. Oz, man, that's a cool backpack. Oz, come stand right here, okay? Thank you. Smile, kid. I'm not a kid. You are a heart. So you can't smile. I just don't want to be in the picture. Okay, so while we're taking that picture and celebrating the kid, if you are an educator and administrator, if you work in a school in any way, shape, or form, we also want to bless you because we know your year is about to get a little bit more hectic. So if that is you, please stand up so that we can... Uh, Bless you. Your tags were actually uh, colored and made by the children's ministry here. They've been working on that the last couple of weeks. And so please come forward uh, for your blessing, and then we will pray together. Uh, Ian and Eli and Naomi and Gabby, please come up and accept your blessing. Yes, Gabby, I see you hiding. Come on. And where's... uh, And Come on, Mr. Oh, okay. Well, I got your sticker. Now, I would love, I know, grown-ups, you know, I would love it if y'all would stay for just a few seconds so we can bless you. While you're, and if you want, if you feel more comfortable sitting down, that's fine. Okay, you get blessed. All right. Will the congregation join me and Charmaine in our blessing of the backpacks? 
With you, O oh God, every transition and new start is a reminder of your goodness. We are grateful for this school year and we pray for students and educators of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds. We pray for their hearts and all they hold. We pray for their minds. That they will expand in wonder and celebration, learning not just from the books studied, but the people beside them. that they will reach out to help welcome and serve. That they will speak words, bringing life and connection. May their voices honor the dignity and belovedness of all. That they will move toward those who feel alone, bless their steps down hallways and sidewalks. that they will see themselves and others with compassion and love. We pray for their ears. <clears throat> that they will genuinely listen to all voices, especially those that haven't been listened to much. And when things get noisy, help them listen extra carefully for your voice. We say a special prayer for, for the parents. parents. The start of a new school year is always another leap of faith. Wrap them with your reassuring love as they entrust their children to others. When questions remain unanswered and the realm of control is finite, bless them with peace and the promise you are right there with their child, whether heading to preschool or driving to college. Bless these faithful servants with courage and confidence, knowing you are in their classroom with a steady hand on their shoulder. Give them peace, patience, and balance in the pressures they face. Bravery to build structures and systems which justly serve all your children and delight in the students before them. May they know their hard work is appreciated and that they are sowing seeds for all our futures. Pray for health and wholeness fun and growth, surprise and amazement for this school year ahead, knowing you will hold us all the way through. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can return Thank to your you. seats. Thank you, uh, teachers, educators, students. Thank you, congregation, for being a part of that. Continue to pray for the, every person you saw up here today. Continue to pray for them all year long because they will need it and it will make a difference. We're about to enter into our time of hospitality. Um, it is an opportunity for you to refresh your coffee and get another donut. It is an opportunity for you to give your offering right here. But most importantly, it is an opportunity for you to connect to one another, which is, we believe, a form of worship when we touch base, check in, see how each other are doing, and grow not only close to our God, but close to one another. So let us stand and let us um, enter our hospitality time. Because it is 
Please be seated. Good morning. I'm Kathy Kenlaw, by the way. I'm a part of the deacons and have been in the church a long time. <laughs> I'm glad to be with you today. So, reading from scripture, John 6, through 35. It's a little long one. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the lake saw that there had been only one boat there. They also saw that Jesus had not got into the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The words of God for the people of God. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you for being here. My name is Mark Green. I'm one of the pastors here. We don't have David Jordan with us this weekend. He usually introduces the other pastors and the other preachers in this space. So I'll introduce myself. If you don't know me, I'm Mr. Mark. So we're glad that you are here. And I would just want to do a shout out to the, how many children and youth we have with us today. That is great. That is fabulous. Zach is doing a fabulous job with our youth. Shelly and Charmaine are doing a fabulous job with our children. We really have first-rate programming here, and it shows. And thank you for sharing your children with us. They are our most precious resource. They are the future of the church, and thank you for sharing them with us. Spread the word. Uh, there's room at the table for more. So thank you for being here. Would you bow your heads with mine as we pray? Our God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. If anyone comes to me, they will never be hungry. If anyone believes in me, they will never be thirsty. So I want us to talk about bread this morning. Jesus, the bread of life. Now, just pause a minute with me. The aroma of fresh bread baking in the oven just somehow or another touches us and fills us with goodness, doesn't it? You have experienced that, hopefully, maybe even many times in your life. Something about it puts us at ease. Something about it calms our hearts. 
Something about, a, is, about bread baking is so elemental to our existence that it just, I don't know, it just makes it all right with the world. And it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. All cultures of the world have their own version of bread. It's a little different from culture to culture, from country to country, people to people, but they all have some version of bread, some grain that they have taken and mixed with water and salt and maybe other ingredients, maybe leaven, maybe not. But they fold it together, they knead it together, they bake it in an oven, and they eat it as a staple of their diet, a staple of their very existence. And we've all experienced that, the different breads of different countries, the different breads of different cultures, and how wonderful that is to our taste. Bread is used at restaurants as a sign of welcome and a hospitality. You've been there, and sometimes the bread's the very first thing they'll serve to your table. It might be a basket of dinner rolls. It might be artisan bread that's already been sliced for you to take and dip in the olive oil and spices. Ooh, mm. oh, that's good. Maybe it is a little loaf of bread that you're supposed to cut and butter, and ooh, that's nice too. Could be uh, cheese biscuits or hush puppies at a seafood restaurant. Ah, yeah, are you hungry yet? Are you hungry yet? Same reason, that hospitality and well, same reason we have donuts here every morning. Okay, I mean, you know, it wasn't our task as a worship service and Fresh Start to feed you, but we have that there because we want you to know that you're welcome in this space. It is hospitality to you. Yum, I'm getting hungry already. Well, my wife Cindy has been retired now for about a year. And all of this newfound freedom of time, she has a long list of household projects that she's been working on. Maybe some of you know about this. Uh, we even had some household projects going on this week at our house. Um, but one of the things that all this newfound freedom of time has given her is a chance to pursue some new interest. And one of the new interests that she's been uh, working on is baking bread. Our son, Nathan, who lives down in Forsyth, Georgia, had gotten into baking bread, and it encouraged his mother, while she was retired, to get all the right apparatuses and put together bake baking bread. And so she bakes bread constantly at our house. In fact, here's one of her loaves right here. Now, I didn't realize she had wrapped it all up in plastic. But her specialty is, and I'll open this up so you can see it, is sourdough bread. Isn't that lovely? Yeah, sourdough bread. And let me tell you, when she's baking bread, it is a process to watch. Uh, it takes about a day and a half. Some of you bread bakers out there may know about this. She works with a starter. Her leaven is a starter that she keeps in the refrigerator. But if she's getting ready to bake bread, she puts it out. Um, over on the stove with a light over it, just giving it a little warmth and lets it rise overnight. Then in the morning, sometime in the morning, she'll put the flour and the salt and the water with it in just the right combinations. Then she kneads it together, sets it aside. Space of time later, kneads it some more and sets it aside. Space of time later, kneads it some more and sets it aside. Finally, late in the day, she'll turn on the oven and she'll bake it in a Dutch oven inside our oven. Woo! Ah, it smells good. Then she takes it out, and if she's timed it just right, and I love it when this happens, it's just before dinner time. She sets it out on a rack to cool just a little and slices it up, and then we serve it with our evening meal with some fresh butter. Woo! Are you hungry yet? Yes, I hear you. I understand. Well, our lectionary passage today, the key verse that we want to focus on is that verse where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never 
be thirsty. So let's put this in context. This is in the sixth chapter of John, and what has happened just before this is the feeding of the 5,000, which also involves, of course, bread, barley loaves, five barley loaves and two fishes. Jesus takes, thanks God for it, blesses it, and distributes it, 5,000 people. Actually, it says 5,000 men, so it's probably counting women and children. It's 12, 14, 15,000, who knows? Thousands and thousands of people sit down on the grassy hillside. They're fed these portions of bread and fish. They all eat to their fill, and they take up 12 baskets left over. Wow. And the crowd is so amazed and impressed by this that they're pressing in on Jesus and his disciples. And Jesus, I respect him for this, wants to get away from the crowd. He's had enough. And he knows why they're, why they're pressing in on him. So the disciples head across the lake to Capernaum. And here's where John inserts, and we're not going to look at that today, but just, just so we know, this is where John inserts Jesus walking on the water to get to Capernaum. And all this crowd finally figures out that they've headed to Capernaum, and here they come as well. So they find Jesus over in Capernaum, and they continue the conversation that they want to have with him. And Jesus knows that they're excited to see him and are pressing in on him because they've just received this bread, this wonderful meal that he has provided miraculously for them. And he challenges them that. You're not coming to me. He, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. He says, you're not coming to me because you're really interested in spiritual matters. You're coming to me because you want more groceries. You're coming to me because you want more bread. You like it, you love it, and you want some more of it. Okay? So he challenges them on that. And Jesus says, do not work for food that perishes, but food that endures for the eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. Jesus wants them and us to go deeper than just asking for physical food that will feed us for a meal or maybe even a day. He wants us to find himself that will fulfill our needs for a lifetime. No, not just a lifetime, for all eternity. He wants to offer us the food that endures this life-sustaining provision that is a gift, truly a gift to us for all time. Well, they ask, what must we do to perform the works of God? In this conversation, they ask really what's a very good question. That's a good question. That's not a bad question for all of us to ask. What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he, whom he has sent. That you believe in him whom he has sent. Jesus is offering them a richer, fuller journey of faith that is far more than physical bread one day at a time. And it hinges on this word believe. And I want us to pause here a minute and talk about this word believe. I think it's often misunderstood. Our first thought when we hear the word believe, we think about head knowledge or getting our facts straight about Jesus. It does involve that to a degree. That's not wrong, but it is so much more than that. The same Greek word that's translated believe here also could mean trust. So Jesus wants us to trust in him. Okay? And I'll go even a step further. I think trust and this is the American sign language for trust. It's like grabbing an old hold of something. Jesus wants us to trust. I think trust is the glue of all good and sustaining and lasting relationships. We talk about love, and rightly so. Love being a very warm and wonderful feeling that we have for another significant other in our lives and how much we love them and adore them and treasure them and cherish them. That, of course, is wonderful. But the real glue comes down to that trust. 
when we trust another individual, we enter into a deep relationship with them. And our English kind of doesn't do us favors here because we don't capture that these are what are known as continual action verbs. Okay, it's not believe one time, it's believe and keep on believing. It's not trust one time, it's trust and keep on trusting. It's cultivate this relationship, that's that glue, this relationship, cultivate it and keep cultivating it through all time. That's what Jesus is inviting us to. Not just to have head knowledge, but to trust in him and to have a relationship with him that will make a difference in our lives for eternity. Well, the crowd asks for a sign. They want a visible, verifiable proof that Jesus is indeed this prophet that they suspect that he is. And then they get to talking about Moses and manna in the wilderness. And you recall the story, and this is, of course, big in Jewish thought the Exodus narrative. And so the children of Israel wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. 40 years. Okay? And they're wandering around in the wilderness. Where were you in 1984? Okay? I mean, that's a long time. Okay? Yeah. They're wandering around in the wilderness, and they're fed every morning by manna. What is it? That's literally what manna means. What is it? Every morning on the dew, they could, they could gather together this white, sweet substance. I'm going to call it frosted flakes. All right, yeah, it's kind of, that's probably about what it was, and quail, and that sustains them six days a week for 40 years. So they talk about this manna that Moses gave them, but their theology's a little off, isn't it? They're thinking that somehow Moses... And Moses is great in their thinking, believe me. But they're somehow thinking that Moses gave that to them. Jesus corrects their theology by saying, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. Jesus is referring to himself. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus is in essence saying, I, or he, is the new manna. He is the manna that will feed you continually and provide for your needs for all time. So they ask about receiving this bread. And then we come to the key verse. How can we get this bread always? Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, this is one of those seven great I am statements of Jesus that we find in, God, in John's gospel. The others are, I am the light of the world. I am the door to the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine and you are the branches. Each of these metaphors give us a snapshot, a picture, portrait, if you will, of something about Jesus' character, something about his essence that helps us to know who he is a little better. Now, we've got to confess that we don't know all that there is to know. We are to be continual learners as disciples of Christ. We do not know all there is to know. But these portraits give us a little glimpse into who he is and help us to understand him more. Philip Yancey is often quoted with this, Anything that we can say, say about God or Christ is an understatement. And I like that. We can't fully comprehend him, but these metaphors help us get a little better understanding of who he is. So what does he mean, I am the bread of life? Jesus knows that deep within us is a spiritual hunger. It's a spiritual hunger planted inside each human. We have a thirst, we have a yearning for that which will satisfy. Jesus is offering us nourishment, sustenance that goes to the heart of our most basic human needs and our spiritual hunger. 
having been created to relate, and I think that's the essence of who we are in God, is to relate first and foremost to God appropriately in Christ and then to relate to one another in Christ, when those relationships are not as they should be, we're somehow left feeling empty. And when we have that emptiness, Jesus knows that we seek to fill that emptiness with all sorts of complicated and ill-informed ways. With money, power, success, various addictions, hard work, notoriety, fame, prestige, keeping up with the Joneses, illicit relationships, a host of bad choices, and on and on and on I could go. You could fill in more blanks. Jesus knows that when we have that emptiness, we seek to fulfill it in the ways that are wrong. None of these will fully satisfy the emptiness of our hearts and lives. Jesus knows this. He's offering to go far past that. Blaise Pascal is often quoted, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. We have a God-shaped vacuum that only God can fill. Jesus is offering us the gift of himself, the bread of life, to fill that deepest hunger in our souls. He's offering us spiritual sustenance. He's offering us himself, the living bread come down from heaven, the new manna to sustain us, to meet us, fill us, sustain us, strengthen us on our journey of faith. More than just for a meal, more than just for a day, more than just a lifetime for eternity. We are nourished and filled from the inside out and satisfied. I'll say even more than satisfied, abundantly filled. So what does this mean for us today here at First Baptist Church of Decatur, here gathered in fresh start this morning? Jesus is offering us a gift. And gifts are offered and hope to be received. He's offering us the gift of himself, the living bread, the bread of life, the bread that endures. He's offering that that we might take it into our hearts and souls and lives and be changed from the inside out and be satisfied from the inside out. And we'll keep chasing the emptiness, we'll keep from chasing the emptiness that fills our hearts in any other way. Along with the psalmist, Jesus wants us to taste and see that the Lord is is good, that he cares for us, provides for us, and sustains us for all eternity. Jesus wants us to have abundant life. You remember this verse, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. In the Beatitudes, we read these words, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And Jesus elsewhere said, I think also in the Sermon on the Mount, seek, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Jesus is offering us the gift of himself. Just as physical bread nourishes our bodies for a meal for a day, Jesus is offering the gift of himself, the living bread, to fulfill us for a lifetime and beyond into eternity. And we're called to accept this gift. Our human response to his divine initiative is to accept this gift, to treasure this gift, and to cultivate a relationship with Jesus Christ, that believe that becomes trust, that becomes relational. To believe, trust, and be in relationship with Jesus Christ. And a, a relationship, like all relationships, have to be cultivated. Is spending time together, getting to know one another, caring for each other, growing in love. How do we do that? We do that in worship. We do that in prayer. We do that in studying the Bible. We do that in serving humanity with our other brothers and sisters in Christ. We do that by caring for one another. That's the way we cultivate this relationship with Jesus Christ that he is calling us to 
that he is offering for us. And I would add this. We're also challenged to give witness about this to others. Having received the bread and the bread of Christ is so good. And having partake of that bread into our very hearts, souls, and lives, we want to share it with others. Charles Spurgeon is quoted often, What is our witness? Is one beggar telling another beggar where to get bread? So we've received the bread. We want to share the bread. We want to tell others about the bread that Christ offers to us. We celebrate communion every Sunday here in Fresh Start. And every time we take of this bread, we are to recall that Jesus is the bread of life. Come to fulfill our deepest longings and needs from the inside out. It tells us of all that he is. Yes, it's about his death and burial and resurrection, but really it's all about him. We've tasted this bread before. We know its texture, but we're reminded every time we take it, of who Jesus is, the bread of life, and how we are to serve him, and how he will fill our hearts and lives to the fullest. So we invite you to the table of our Lord. This is his table, not ours. Everyone here is invited to partake of this bread and be reminded of Jesus, the living bread, in your hearts and lives. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples in the upper room. And after the meal, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant outpoured for you. Take, drink, you all of it, and do this in remembrance of me. We invite our band to come forward first, and when you hear the music playing, we invite you to come forward and receive the bread of Christ. He is offering us all a gift this day. Receive the bread and the fruit of the vine as a reminder of all that he is and all that he has done for us and the gift that he offers us. Let's worship together. Band, if you'll come forward. Amen.
please stand. bunch of things that you need to know about that are happening in and around this campus. And I'm going to let you know what they are. First, youth back to school bash tonight, four to eight, um, or five to eight. I'm so sorry. It's on the fourth. That's where I got the four from, right? Um, it's going to be an amazing time. So if you are a youth, I hope you're going or planning to go. If you need more information, talk to Zach. Tomorrow, the Decatur Fine Arts Academy has their second second full year. Um, they're starting. Um, it's starting tomorrow. And so if you are of any age and are interested in taking music lessons, please get in touch with the Decatur Fine Arts Academy. They are, um, we host them here, but they are not part of the church, but we sponsor them, we host them, we are so grateful that they're part of the Decatur community and we want them to thrive. They're also just some amazing musicians offering fabulous education to our community. And so if you're interested in taking a lesson, get in touch with them. On August 13th, we have our first of two conversations events that are coming up in, in August. The first one is going to be author Deb Miller Landau, who is going to be talking about her book, A Devil Went Down to Georgia. Um, timely, it's going to be challenging and convicting. That conversations event is going to be right here in Carriker on August 13th at 7 p.m., then the very next day, in the sanctuary upstairs, we're going to have author Casey McQuiston talking about their book, The Pairing. It's going to be a lot of fun. I hear there's a whole theme for what you should wear for that, so check Casey out on Instagram to find out what they decided the theme was going to be. That's going to be August 14th at 7 p.m. upstairs. If you're ever interested in volunteering for one of these conversations events, they're a really worthwhile way to get be a part of the community. Get in touch with me because I can um, get you connected with a way to volunteer for those events. Today is the first Sunday of the month, which is the Sunday that we always take up an offering for the assistance ministry. So every week we take up an offering for our general church, but the first Sunday of the month we take up a special offering that goes towards the most vulnerable in our community. So if you are um, feel so led, there will be, I think, Cecil with a basket at the back um, as you exit to um, collect money for the assistance ministry. Another one that we forgot to put in there, I think we have a slide for it though, Yes, thank you, Randall. The Decatur Avondale Children's Choir is having a parents' night out on Friday. Parents, you get to drop your kids off and let other people babysit them. They have movie, pizza, all kinds of fun stuff, and then you, parent, get to go do your own thing. It's a great thing for you, but it's a great thing for the Decatur Avondale Children's Choir because they are fundraising for their Carnegie Hall trip, which will happen in November. We're taking 56 youth to Carnegie Hall to sing there, and we need money to make that happen. So go have a date night and help out the choir. And finally, as you leave, please, if you have not already done so, please say a prayer and tie a nod on the prayer quilt in the back of the room. This one today is so much fun. It's gorgeous, but it's for Neil Keener. So many of us know and love him, and he is home today, probably watching and recovering from surgery, and we want to let him know that our prayers and love are with him. Go in the peace of Christ and be filled in your spirits from the inside out with the goodness of the Lord, the bread of life, and share that bread with others. 
as you go. In Christ's name, amen.